I'm Zoe. And I'm Chandi. And this is Bound by the Cloak. Roller Derby is a full contact sport that had its beginnings in the 1930s, was really big in the 60s and 70s, and made a huge comeback in the early 2000s after it kind of disappeared in the 80s and 90s. It's still going strong, but not that many people know what it is or have ever heard about it. Yeah, and I gotta be honest, I am one of those people. I had heard about roller derby, but I didn't really know much about it. I didn't know how it was played, that it was still played nationally and globally. So what did you know about roller derby before? Before today? <laughs> I thought roller derby was played by women on skates. And for some reason, in my mind, it was like they had these older vintage uniforms. I don't know why, don't ask me, but that's kind of what I pictured. Older uniforms? Kind of like 70s era skating uniforms. I guess when I think of roller derby, I think about the 70s. I don't think about really anything else. Well, that actually makes a lot of sense because that's the time when it was probably, it was like a really big thing in the 70s. I mean, they even played in Madison Square Garden. That's how big roller derby used to be. I did not know yeah. that. And yeah, I don't think many people know that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my dad told me, you know, a lot about roller derby. And then um, for me, watching roller derby happened, um, for the most part, there's a particular summer when I was working at a movie theater and I would get off work super late at night. And there was this channel that I would just be flipping through channels in the middle of the night, right? Because I got home, I need to kind of unwind. And I'm flipping through channels and I see roller derby. The only two things that were on that late at night were PokerStars.net, Texas Hold'em, and Gotham Girls Roller Derby. So that's how I became familiar with modern roller derby. Welcome to Bound by the Cloak. Today, we are joined by the one, the only, Susie Hot Rod, one of the OGs of Gotham Roller Derby. New York City's Roller Derby League. Susie, thanks for joining us on today's show. Thank you for having me. I feel so derby old <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's great. But how are you doing? How's everything going? Yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Gotham Roller Derby is in our 19th season. We're wow. playing games at Prospect Park and we have a few more left in the season. I'm feeling pretty good. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, I mean, you've been with Gotham for a really long time. And, you know, we're, we're excited to dive right in to your story and um, discussing Gotham Roller Derby. But before we do that, for those who don't know anything about Roller Derby, what is it? What is its history? If you can just kind of like briefly sum it up. Yeah, so roller derby is a sport played on quad roller skates. It is a full contact sport. Now we play it on a flat track as opposed to our kind of cartoon memory of roller derby of the campy 70s like Raquel Welch, Kansas City Bomber. We, we play it on the flat track now because it's much more accessible to just find a flat space, put down some tape and play. Although uh, in New York City, we've actually found it's still very difficult to just locate a large flat space to play roller derby. But I digress. You play offense and defense at the same time because you have a person with a star in their helmet that's a jammer. And when they pass a player on the other team, they get a point. So you want to help your jammer get through by playing offense and you want to stop their jammer by playing defense. So it becomes very chaotic because it's one of the only sports where a human is the ball and offense and defense are played at the same time on roller skates. So it can be a little wild. I can't believe it exists, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who thought of this? <laughs> oh, really, though? Yeah. <laughs> roller Derby started as just a very long roller skating race. And then people were really bored with it. And they found that the fans really only enjoyed it when people accidentally fell or spilled and, and took a big crash. So eventually it kind of turned into roller derby. People's lust for blood and action. <laughs> 
That's really funny because my dad has always been a fan of roller derby. So he's almost 80, but he like recalls like those moments of roller derby, like in the 50s and 60s. Of just oh, and even when it was at its most campy, when there was all kinds of hijinks, like sort yeah. of tied in with wrestling and, and there was like, a, you know, a hero and a heel. <laughs> the, the skating itself was so impressive. And the yeah. fact that they barely wore like any sport, they barely wore any protective gear. <laughs> I still, I still enjoy watching the clips. Yeah. So and here we are today, many <laughs> years later, still skating. <laughs> yeah. With more rules and, and um, less injuries. That was our, our beginnings in history. And today's modern sport is much more different. Uh, we, we hopefully wish it to be on par with soccer or, or anything along those lines to be uh, athletically legitimate and less theatric. Uh, but it, we do have some pretty campy roots. And that's part of our story. So you've been with Gotham Roller Derby. So can you just tell us what is Gotham Roller Derby? Yeah, Gotham Roller Derby is New York City's Roller Derby League. We have been around since 2003. There are Roller Derby Leagues all over the world. In the United States, we're part of an organization called the Women's Flat Track Roller Derby Association. That's kind of like the equivalent of the NBA for us. And um, we've played all over the world. We have done training camps, but we're, we're the New York City's Roller Derby League. And we have uh, four teams that represent the boroughs. We haven't grown large, in it, large enough yet for Staten Island, but, but stay tuned, Staten Island. We're coming for you. And we're a nonprofit business model. We have community classes to teach roller skating. We have junior roller derby. We have positions for volunteers. We're all skater owned and operated. It's very grassroots. So no Staten Island, the forgotten borough. We're still growing, but maybe someday, you know, we're, we're always recruiting. If anyone wants to join and we get enough players, we could always add that fifth team. So like you said, roller derby is all around the world. Um, where is roller derby taking you to? What, where have you played? Roller derby has taken me all over the world. Before I played roller derby, I joined when I was 23. I had only ever been on an airplane once. And in roller derby, I've been to Australia, New Zealand. I've been to Finland multiple times because those wonderful European countries have a lot of government subsidy to support athletics. So they have a lot of events in Europe. I've been to England. I've been to Colombia, all over the United States. In the very beginning of roller derby, our league Gotham Roller Derby coached in Alaska. I liken the birth of roller derby to a comparison of learning how to speak another language before somebody else. And then you went and told someone else the language that you learned. So that's kind of how roller derby started. Because in the beginning, in 2003, even though obviously we were using the internet and social media, it was barely on Facebook. It was still in a time of like paper flyers. I don't even think people were using Google Docs at that time. So information was still shared in person at that point in time. So it really was an interesting beginning of a story to have that more um, tangible word of mouth at the very beginning. And then to take you all over the world. It's wild. So what's your story? How and why did you get into roller derby? Well, Susie Hot Rod was born in a punk band. <laughs> I had a band when I was in college. Not that any of us knew how to play instruments, but we wanted to start a band. And, you know, we knew that we needed fake names. That was crucially important. So <laughs> we picked fake names and I chose Susie Hot Rod. So that was my band name before roller derby, which is why it's not very clever. It was thought up by, you know, a 21 year old who was drinking too much at the time and living on like Chinese food. But uh, I started as a band person and we had a punk band. It was an all female punk band. And then I met a friend in the music scene who was a bass player. And she said, I think that you would like this roller derby thing. My friend who sits with me at a knitwear design company across the desk started a roller derby league in New York City. And there, there's a few of us that are doing it. And I had no idea what it was. And at that time, there was only a few leagues. The league founder had traveled to Austin, Texas, which is where the roller derby rebirth happened. And her and her best friend from Los Angeles each saw it and each reported back to L.A. and New York and started roller derby leagues. It was incredible. And, and it was just a time where it was crazy people who were 
not athletic. It was it was like creative types. It was people that were clothing designers and photographers and writers. And we were very closely connected with the burlesque community. And it was all these misfits that didn't know how to play roller derby and likely hadn't been athletic since like high school PE. And <laughs> that's how it started. Cecilia told me about it and I went. And then it just stuck. You know what? 19 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> But it started at such a unique, special time when there really was, you know, under 10 people. Like at that time, Gotham Roller Derby was small. They were skating in in roller rinks. We don't even have those anymore in New York City. They're gone. They've been lost in the history of New York City. The roller rinks are gone. We used to go to Empire, um, which was a huge dance skating community. And we would go on open adult night skates and skate with the dance skaters with our pads and helmets, not know how to roller skate. And they were so friendly and welcoming into their space. And we went to the skate key in the Bronx. And it was a really wild time of just when you look back on it, I remember being like, this will be nothing, I, I, but I'm going to do it. It seems kind of fun. And now it's like a chapter in a history. It's It's kind of hard to believe that it all came together and so quickly. And um, now it's it's history and now it's all over the world. And, and now there are children playing. And uh, yeah, that's how it started. And then I just stayed, I guess. So how were your skating abilities in the beginning? Could you skate before or did you really like, I mean, at all? Or like, was this like you're really like your first time on skates? When I started playing roller derby, my roller skating experience was pretty much limited to birthday parties in the 80s. And then that brief moment where rollerblades were really hot, I got a pair for $30 at Bradley's <laughs> and would a little bit skate in them outside to friends' houses and stuff. But I was not a, a rink rat or someone that did roller figure skating or feet skating or something like that. I did play sports when I was younger, but as soon as I became old enough to be teenage socially rebellious. I was not into the culture or the people that played sports. So I think I had a natural inclination for athleticism, but my personality uh, did not fit that. So that kind of ended as soon as I got into high school and I found other like-minded weirdos to sit with in the back of the cafeteria. So <laughs> roller derby kind of filled that perfect connection of my high school back table weirdo friends. And then we were like, sure, let's just put on some skates. What could possibly go wrong? Which is how roller derby started. It was in Austin where a bunch of people that worked at bars were like, wouldn't it be funny if we all just bought roller skates and each bar made a team and played roller derby? And that's how it started. That sounds amazing. It's crazy, right? And then once they put in all the effort to learn, they were like, oh, this took a long time. We might as well stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> You're bringing back memories like United Skates and Bradley's. That's I, Yeah, it's been yeah. quite a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm 42, so I have memories that go all the way back to then, you know. <laughs> Making me feel old too. That's I can't believe I'm still skating at 42. A roller derby is like, I'm happy that it's become more competitive and athletic, but I'm also happy that there's still a place where someone that's in their 40s can still hold their own because I don't know if that's necessarily the case with a lot of athletic things. So I'm really lucky that I still feel good. You know, I'm a little sore, but you know, that's inevitable from falling down for 20 years because I definitely still fall down a lot after 30 right it's like everything just starts hurting so yeah. things hurt and i move a lot slower and i recuperate slower and also time passes faster it feels like well <laughs> like i'm like where did the day go what happened what was that a year what just happened yeah i think when i was younger i was like accomplishing like 10 times the amount of things in 24 hours and now i'm like that's enough just talking about how roller derby has evolved from when it first began all the way back in the 1930s and then in the 70s when it was a little bit more dramatic or, you know, like you had mentioned, wrestling on skates. So do you still think, do you still think it's evolving or it's pretty much like a fine-tuned, well-oiled machine right now? I think roller derby is still evolving in the sense that it doesn't feel like the place it was five years ago. I Sometimes I compare roller derby to dog years because so much happens in a year and so much changes and the longevity of skaters isn't really that long either. So it's almost like a new generation is coming in so frequently that it feels like it's really always evolving and changing. So it is, yeah. And also like everyone in the whole world, the pandemic really hit a reset button, changed a lot of things about how we operate, about how 
dedicated we are with our time, what is sustainable, what was unrealistic. Like it really forced people to take a step back and evaluate their connection to it. And there's definitely like a, a rebuild feeling happening right now. We had a practice warehouse. We would have some games there. That's definitely different. The cost of real estate is more like, so logistical things I would say um, are definitely something that's always evolving. But yeah, I'd say like it does feel internally that it changes so frequently. But I will say to the external person, most people still don't know that it even exists. So we're still kind of like rolling a snowball uh, into a bigger and bigger thing or, you know, shaping it because on the inside, intricately, you would say it's totally different than it was three years ago. But if you go out and hand out flyers, like 90% of the people that you run into don't even know that it exists. So... It's important to remember outside of our little biodome where we're obsessive <laughs> that the general community still doesn't know us. It's not wrestling anymore. Hopefully they're, you know, we're like, just come, you'll, you'll like it. You know, don't even, if, if your only context is Whippet and Raquel Welch, it's, yeah. that's great. Come, come watch it. You'll like it. Nobody, nobody's going to freak out or to get there. And, you know, people still love it. I mean, it's high, high intensity women that are strong and fast and people are falling and there's carnage and it's you don't even have to know what's going on to enjoy it which is yeah. something special about it versus another sport where you might just be like i don't get it you don't even need to get it to to love it which is kind of wonderful especially speaking of um the fact that a lot of people don't know much about it can you describe the culture of roller derby because it's kind of unique Yes, the culture of roller derby is very unique. It's very closely knit. It's very social because we build it. And like, if you have a gym, you pay money, you go to the gym and you leave. In roller derby, you have to like build the gym and clean the gym and secure all of the things in the gym. So it's, it's very much a collaborative collective. And so it results in a, a culture of being very immersed, very close with one another, like we do everything. We have a game. Everyone's out there laying down the tape, setting up the sound, like um, handing out uh, programs. It's all the skaters that do it. And we pay dues to do it. We don't get any money. You know, we certainly pay ourselves just to be a part of it. Um, but it has a very DIY culture. It is, you know, when you go to an exercise class, you don't talk to the other people. You go, you exercise and you leave at roller derby. When I go to roller derby practice, I feel like I've hung out with my friends, like because in between drills, we will talk. It's social. It's really fun. I get to become close with people that I don't come across in my normal everyday life. And we become friends because we're bonded over this thing that we give all of our like blood, sweat and tears to. And so it's just really hard to replicate that. People always joke like when they leave roller derby, they're like, how do you make friends as an adult? without this like i all my friends are from here and you know like if i look into my phone book i can tell you like i have like you know 19 years of friends that i've made and and i've kept after they've moved on but it's just a wonderful community that's so much more rich than um something that you would pop in and then pop out i mean when we have four teams but like the secret is that we all practice together every day until game day and then we split off and have a game you know like it's a logistical thing you know a lot of love. So you guys really all know each other pretty well. Yeah, we do. We do. But we do still always call each other by our derby names. <laughs> it's, we still use it. We always use the derby names. And to answer your question about how do you make friends as an adult, it's really hard. It is roll. hard. And yeah. do I hang, try to talk to my coworkers? Do I go to like the MoMA on members night? Play roller derby. Yeah, if you if anyone's ever curious to become social, like maybe they are like, I'm I don't know how to connect with people, join roller derby because you can meet people from all over and you don't have to be a skater either. We have all kinds of people that are we have people who help with the stats. We have people that are just like graphic designers that like to make posters. Like it's a big community. So if uh if the flying through the air on roller skates and putting your self and bodily injury might not totally be your thing. You might still dig our culture as a member of our secret society. With it being super inclusive, what do you think attracts so many people to the sport, if not just the inclusivity? Hopefully the roller derby team, especially as the future grows, becomes more and more diverse. Of course, we're concerned with diversity and inclusion um, more than we were at the beginning when we were doing like pillow fights, you know, <laughs> but uh, as we grow and we hope to attain those things, I do think no matter who's there, 
of all the different people, like they have this spark for a little bit wild. I mean, otherwise you would go play like pickleball or something, right? Like there has to be something inside of you that's like, why am I attracted to that? Why is something so crazy, so attractive to me? And I can at least say from my standpoint of being a person that's involved with it, it's that it's a unique world that doesn't really exist in my real life. And I can be so free of everything else that's happening when I'm not at the rink. And I can be so physical and really exhaust myself and be almost, it's like an animal kind of primitive thing where you're like, you hit me, I'll hit you back. Or like, I'm sweating. And then someone's trying to hit me. And then um, it's really freeing. And I don't know if people on the outside know that, but that's part of the allure for me. Like there is no like gym activity that replicates like the feeling of like playing a sport where you're like really in the moment of being so physical and we're not physical people, especially not adults, really, you know, like no, very few adults have experienced how good it feels to do something that's so crashingly physical. And then when the pandemic happened, all of us were like, oh my God, I'm so depressed. Why am I so depressed? It's because your brain's not getting that like endorphin rush of just the absolute craziness, but it's also in this like weird controlled environment, right? Because it's not it's not, you're, you're not at work. You're not worried about like, if I don't do well, I won't get hired again or something. You know, it's just this like special little place where you can just be very, very like physical. There's no, oh, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, why did I do that? Like, there's no thinking about anything. It's, it's very, it's very freeing. It's like the only place where you can be totally clear in your brain because there's just so much going on. I hope that's what attracts people. I guess you'd have to ask everybody what their interest, but certainly that's why I've always stayed because it's a special moment of clarity that I can't have anywhere else. Just being that physical and having it be unapologetically okay to, to be really strong and reactionary, which is something that in life, I think we purposely don't want to be overly aggressive or quick to, to react with almost like it's not anger or rage, but it's like a controlled outlet for those emotions in a way uh, that's a safe place to do it. And so, it's badass. No, well, yeah. <laughs> it's still badass. So there are players of every height, weight, shape, size, whatever, you know, um, and even like um, varying ages. Is there a point where it's too, like somebody's too old to join roller derby or would you say it's just, it's just open to everybody? Roller derby is open to everybody. It is a competitive sport, but it's not in any way a professional sport where anyone could be, you know, pushed out for not being as good as someone else because it's a very collaborative community and a lot of people find their roles within the sport just by being a part of it because the teamwork thing is also a part of it. Maybe let's say you're like not as fast as someone else, but you work really well with that person sticking together on the track. And there's so many different roles on the team that different body shapes thrive in different roles as well. And that's one of the advantages. And hopefully like we outwardly display that, that people see it and they say, oh, there's people of all shapes and ages. And, and hopefully that can be, you know, an attractive, we're still an amateur sport. Like we are at the heart of us there for the love and for the fun, right? Because there's no money in it. It's just us giving of ourselves. And so hopefully a place where people are like, wow, I, I could be a part of that. That, that looks Hope we want, you know, especially as we grow more into the future, we think more about like, can can someone come and say like, I that looks like me, I could be like that, and that's something, you know. Of course, we are are focused more on trying to to diversify and make it feel inclusive to everybody. It's for everybody who's willing to do it. Like, it's if you have the heart, you have to have roller skates, <laughs> but you know, you're always welcome. And it's a chemistry thing because it's a team sport. When you get your new teammates, it's immediately like a bonding happens because you're practicing together, you're working on plays together, and you learn how to play as a unit instead of individuals for the team sport aspect. What are some of the most common misconceptions about roller derby have you heard, or maybe that you've had when you first started out? Definitely a misconception about roller derby is that it's played on the bank track, because that's a pop culture thing. It's not played on a bank track anymore. There are some leagues that do that, but in, in our league, it's it's a flat track. And of course, the first thing people say is like, oh, you beat each other up on roller skates. And we're like, we don't have fist fights. Like, I think that like if someone comes in with a, the campy vision of it, 
I think they're going to like it anyway, you know? So if that gets them in the door, that's totally fine. Obviously it's like exhaustive to have to like explain like, well, we're really playing a sport, but yeah, it's like, would you be like, Oh, you soccer players, do you roll, wrestle on the floor and make out and like take showers together? Like, so obviously there's like an element of of that sexualized campiness that still is in people's cartoon vision of roller derby for sure. But if it's enough to get a person willing to just watch it, people are hopefully just going to come and enjoy what they see, you know, like, so the stereotypes that we have to kind of like explain, at least hopefully if it gets someone to watch us, maybe they'll come and buy a t-shirt and maybe they'll like what they see. Like we get a lot of by day, by night, you know, like by day, a mild mannered librarian and by night, a wild she wolf, you know, like, okay, like, or why don't we just talk about how we're like a cool organization that's doing it ourselves. But these are some of the angles that have been uh, pretty common that we've heard over the years, for sure. Obviously, roller derby is big on punny names and personas and personalities that are, you know, I mean, kind of create your own persona, right? As you're derby name and your sort of character in a way what goes into picking the best derby name picking a derby name it can be whatever you want some people don't even take derby names i find a lot of the ones that tickle me are the ones that have sentimental value to the skater that like um we have a astrophysicist who's big banger that's hilarious (laughs) that's amazing uh those those ones um are the ones that always get me the most my real name, like on my driver's license, is Gene. And I was always in love with the roller derby player from Kansas City named Dominant Gene. They thought that was so clever. But yeah, they can be puns. They can be personal jokes. They can be uh, in reference to, to your day job. I'm, I'm trying to like I have a, a friend who is uh, Aaron Water Show. And that's like specifically like calling back to Ohio because they have air and water shows in Ohio. Like it's kind of like a local thing. But um, and, you know, then there'll be other people that are like just like the wrench, <laughs> which is also kind of fun. But yeah, you can you can do whatever you want. And also people change their derby names too. like people are always changing and that's it. people change their derby names, too. So, yeah, it's whatever you like. Like other sports and like all sports, you have fans. So, you know, what are the fans of roller derby like and how do you interact with them? thing that's really cool about roller derby is that we're so accessible to the fans. They're literally sitting like an arm's length away from us at all times. Like after we play, you can talk to us. We can sign autographs for kids like you can come right up to us. It's not like if you're going to go to like a baseball game and you're like 100 million feet away and the hot dog costs thirty seven dollars. Like we're really close physically to our fans. Some are really devout, bring like funny signs and they'll be cheering and wearing crazy outfits. And then a lot of our fans are just people that came for the first time and never even knew. And, you know, hopefully they come back and they tell their friends. But uh, Derby fans are like non I would say definitely non-traditional sports fans. I don't think necessarily that there's an overlap, although certainly any traditional sports fans I would love to see come to roller derby. Absolutely. But we're certainly in a little pocket of like delightful fringe, you know, like it should feel like a lot of fun to come, you know, like, you don't not like a thing where everyone comes in. Like, I would love to see all the audience like wearing like roller derby jerseys, but it's just like a wonderful rainbow of all kinds of kooky people. You know, a lot of our family members are still there just like it was a high school basketball game like a lot of people's parents and siblings come it's still very intimate in that way and because it's an accessibly priced sporting event we don't have to call the management to say like oh my mom wants to come like everybody's family comes all the time because it's just like a mom and pop enough feeling of an event where people's families come and co-workers and things like that i've heard you described as being roller derby famous do you agree with that and also have you ever had a situation where somebody picked you out in public you know like just kind of picked you out of a crowd like they knew who you were or do you think it's just the name in general Susie hot rod that that people have heard but they don't exactly like know your face they can't identify you i will say that derby famous is a thing because it's uh, like our little biodome so within our little biodome of roller derby people tend to know who i am because i've been around a long time i've played on the team usa i've been on gotham roller derby and we've been uh, a team at the top uh, for many years so in the roller derby community it's like called derby famous it's actually the best kind of fame because outside of that little biodome you're just a regular person so like 
once every two months when I have a roller derby game, I feel like a famous person. And then the second I walk out of there, I'm just a regular person again. It's so lovely. And then there'll always be like a really odd thing. Like one time I was in Marshalls and one of the security people was like, I've seen you. You're on that TV show that plays after midnight on the Cable Access channel because there was one year where the roller derby games just kept getting rerun on Cable Access in the middle of the night. And he was like, I was in the hospital and I just watched TV all the time and I saw you every night for like a month. (laughs) So there are like some kind of like random you know, sightings. And then they just make you blush because you're like, I'm not a famous person. So like, but I'm a fringe, like a triple E level celebrity. Like that's just something to celebrate because I don't have all the like downsides. I can go wherever I want. I have my freedom. I think when things can be a little crazy, like there was a time where Gotham Roller Derby was top of the game. Like, and Bonnie Thunders and I were very popular in roller derby and we couldn't like we would be walking into like the tournaments and people would just be like, oh, let's take a photo. Um, you know, know like oh can you sign this or whatever and our teammates would be like okay this is getting a little crazy like we need to go to the game now and it's only within our little biodome right it's not like it's outside in the real world where we can't walk down the street but like i couldn't imagine what that would be like where you actually just couldn't leave your home and have privacy so being derby famous is kind of fun because you know one day a year people know who you are and then the rest you're pretty anonymous so that kind of uh it's kind of good i'm into it it's like the perfect level of fame for you It is perfect. And I think a lot of this ties in with money in a way like I don't get money to play roller derby and with real fame, there's like money and contracts and like your face is everywhere. And like in in derby, it's just like you get to be special for one afternoon and sign an autograph to a child, which I'm going to tell you something like there is no better feeling in the world than to like sign an autograph to a child. And like they have a poster that like has your name written on it like that feeling. I've it's the best feeling I've ever had. Like if you could bottle that and sell that, it's just like, oh, wow, it's so amazing, you know? You know, some of the juicy stuff we just want to know is, what's the worst injury you've ever had or what's the hardest you've been hit? Well, everybody jokes that like there are some hard hits that make you pee a little. (laughs) That's happened. People have been like hit so hard their tampon kind of comes out. (laughs) That's happened to people. Me personally, I've been pretty unscathed considering a lot of the injuries that can happen in roller derby. We have a lot of a lot of knee injuries that are very serious, ligament tears and ankle breaks. That that happens a lot in roller derby. I haven't had those. My worst injury actually was, um, and it sounds so much worse than it is, but it sounds really dramatic. I was playing one time on a concrete floor and my knee pad slipped and I fell and I fell on my knee and it, it just really hurt and it was swollen. And uh, the next day I was like, I should probably go to the doctor when they x-rayed it. Technically, it had a, a break in the kneecap, which sounds so gross and horrible, but um, it's a bone and then it grows back. So like in four weeks, I actually felt a lot better. But it sounds so dramatic to be like, I fell and my kneecap broke. Ugh, like it's a- So no, I mean, I've been really fortunate to have avoided a serious injury. Although I will say like day to day, especially when I was training with with the all-stars when we were at our most competitive, I was exhausted and sore all the time, which was a tough way to live because we do go into work like normal people every day. And you're just like, oh man, like my ass is dragging. Like this is, this is tough. Like I was at a three hour practice and like the air conditioning wasn't on in the practice space. And like, I'm so gassed, but then you're like, oh, right. I have a regular career just like a normal person. And so I can't just be like oversleeping and like (laughs) limping down the hallway. Although I think a lot of us have gone into work a little limpy, but we make it. My one friend got a one time cheapskate hit Bunny so hard it launched her into the crowd, into the bleachers, and she hit the bleachers and broke her collarbone. That was like a really dramatic roller derby history story. That was crazy. Yeah, it sounds that's intense. Yeah, that was that was pretty rough. Usually just like a, a when a crazy like when everyone in the pack falls down and then gets up safe, you're like, OK, that was fun, but kind of weird. And I didn't really like that. Let's not do that again. But then the fans are like, oh, my gosh, it's insane out there. Everyone loves a big hit, right? What is one of the most memorable moments in your roller derby career so far? Oh, that's such a good question. It's really hard to remember everything. I have like a roller derby amnesia. I just remember like there was a home team game many years ago that like 
we won in the last, you know, few minutes or something. Like it was so long ago. It was actually in a venue that we haven't even played in in like 10 years. But I just remember like the wonderful feeling of like hearing the crowd erupting, like to the point where you felt like air was physically coming off of them because they were like cheering so much and like banging. And it was just when you were in the moment of playing the game, it was like in a movie where like when the person only hears like like a heartbeat and everything is really silent, even though the whole room is erupting. Like I've, I've had that feeling before. And then the action happens and you like scored the points and then then like the sound comes back on and the arena is erupting and people are like banging on wooden bleachers. And I, I just remember that. I don't like I said, it's so vague. Like I don't remember what game it was. I don't remember who was playing like, but I just remember those like experiences, those like sensory experiences and how unique and rare it is to have experienced that. Uh, that That's just something that I, I'll always carry that with me. Like, wow, what an experience that was. And the one time we got to play bank track roller derby in Australia, that was crazy. <laughs> I can't believe that happened. That happened. LA and New York got hired to play bank track roller derby on a little mini tour of Australia. And we were playing in like concert venues and we were playing like along the same tour route as Nickelback. <laughs> we were like, what the hell? It was weird. It, it didn't sell a lot of tickets. It really wasn't a success. Whoever thought of the idea, I hope they didn't get fired, but we were really excited <laughs> to do it. And I, I had a blast. So I felt like at the Rolling Stones, I would be like going up into the airplane and be like, take my photo on the staircase. I feel like Led Zeppelin. <laughs> that happened? <laughs> that was the golden age, I think. Can you give Zoe and me derby names? Yes. Okay. We, we just going to add uh, E to yours so you can be Chan Die. <laughs> but that's a little silly. I mean, think about your, your personal interests, your history. Like, is there any kind of hobbies you have? Are you a cat person? You know, like. Have you thought about it yourselves? I'm curious. You can make an alter ego, like your superhero uh, band name kind of thing. I have not thought of any of this. Yeah, I don't know. My only hobbies are like um, collecting Pez dispensers, horror movies, really into music. That's about it. There has to be a lot of, well, there's certainly a lot of music pun names and in, in horror movie. Yeah, we have a, a writer who was M Dash, which was really funny. <laughs> I like that one. It's really your own journey. It'll come to yeah. you at a weird time. You know, I'll, I'll think of like one for you like three days from now when I'm like in the shower <laughs> and I'll be like, that's it. That's the one. Zoe will be this. <laughs> well, at least Chandi got one. That's good. And it works. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I can either do it immediately or it'll come to me like <laughs> at the worst possible time when I'm supposed to be focused on something else. I'll just be like, boom, there it is. Do you have like a, a ritual before a game? Do you, is there like a song you listen to to hype you up or anything? Oh, I am terrible with traditions. Yeah, like I, I've only worn one specific kind of pants. I'll only wear this one kind of pants. For years, I only wore this one kind of underwear until it actually just like fell apart and I stopped wearing it. <laughs> like I, for a while, it was that way. I still wear the same pants. I just have to, you know, those are just like, if we have a game where it's like outdoors and it's like 107 degrees, I'll be like, I can't wear shorts. I have to wear those pants. <laughs> I do get a little like superstitious about the pants. I do. But other than that, um, nowadays, you know, there's just so much multitasking going on that uh, we used to have a lot more time to like prepare and so sometimes you'd be at home being like, oh my God, if I don't just listen to some music and clear my head, I'm going to just be freaking out all day. I just have to get to the game, you know, like, or you'd have really funny stress dreams where like, I've had dreams where I've had to roller skate, but it's grass. And then one of my wheels is missing. And then, you know, these like roller derby uh, anxiety dreams. Those are pretty funny too. You know, like uh, the, the clock won't stop running or, you know, you know, like things of this nature, but I am uh, superstitious about the pants. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. It seems like roller derby is not just a sport, but almost like a lifestyle for you. So how do you balance it with everything else going on in your life? Yeah, roller derby can be a lifestyle for sure. I heard somebody once say that it's like a gas and that it'll fill the shape that you give it. So if you give it everything, it's going to take over your whole life. So I think one of the secrets to my longevity is like trying to kind of step back. Uh, there was a time, you know, when I started where I would be like, on five committees and head of this committee and head of that committee. And after a, a while, I really learned that wasn't going to like be sustainable for me. Now, of course, it's very important that people do step into those roles. Like we can't have everybody just floating along like a tenured professor, you know, but I think it is important to learn how to set boundaries. Like I've played a long time and this season, I live so far from the practice space, which I never had before. And now like I 
I just don't make the attendance numbers that I used to, you know, like I'll, I'll hit like the, the minimum requirement. And like, there'll be people who are playing like at the really competitive level on the all-stars and they're clocking in like 35 hours of skating a month. And I'm like, I did 10. That's all I could give you, but is it okay? Like we're cool. Right. So I think like just figuring out what works best for you so that you both, you know, benefit our culture is trying to teach us more to like set boundaries and do what's right for you. You know? So I I try to do that with my roller derby too. Um, But you know, it's a little hard because you get like a guilt. It's not like if you skip a class at the gym, who cares? But like, if I, if I don't go to the last team practice before the game, I'm going to let down all my buds, you know, like the balance is a little tricky. And I certainly like, I put a lot into like my extracurricular life, you know, like I, I don't have like a highly competitive career. Like I, I work with the city. I'm like a civil servant and I have a job where I don't work more than 40 hours a week. Like, and that's not normal in our American culture. People work like 60 hour weeks. So I've chosen like a lifestyle where I have a job that's pays less, but takes less of my time. And that's like a total decadence that nobody, I hardly know anybody that gets to work under four. Like I I get 40 hours a week and a one hour lunch break. Nobody gets that, right? Like who, nobody I know, that's why none of my friends want to go out because they're tired because they've been working like, you know, 60 hour work week. So I guess one of the secrets to my longevity is that like, I have all this fun Susie hot rod time because I chose a, I chose a, job that allows me to do that but that's definitely very rare you know my story yeah. is is not normal who my my charmed life i always joke that i live in like the gumdrop house on lollipop lane because like, <laughs> i have it pretty good so obviously you're no longer on the all-stars but i assume you're still skating strong do you plan on being involved with roller derby forever and i guess how has your role changed in Gotham roller derby or just roller derby in general? Yeah, I have stopped playing high level global competition in 2014. Uh, and I just played on the home teams, like the local games. And then I think I'm still like relied upon to be a player that delivers under pressure. Um, so it's like kind of a personal journey for me to navigate that pressure because I know that my body is not trained like it once was. But everyone's like, oh, but you're Susie Hot Rod. Oh, but you're Susie Hot Rod. And I'm like, well, but I'm not in shape like I used to be, you know, like, so that's a personal battle that I have to navigate on my own. Cause to the outside, people are just like, Oh, just go do the thing, do the Susie thing. And I'm like, but I have, I'm, I'm very like mentally unsure because I used to be, um, extremely, uh, regimented in my fitness routine, but I think like learning how to, to come to terms with what I can give is, is a challenge, you know, like I can't be there every day now and, and I'm a little older now. And otherwise, like I did some coaching. I used to coach uh, the rec league. I coached the juniors for a while. And now like recently, it's been really a challenge because I just don't live close to where we are right now. So I've this year, I've really only been trying to like just make my attendance, you know, and it's tough because like I'll see a parent and they'll be like, when are you coming back to juniors? The kids miss you. And I'm like, I know it's just I can't I can't. I can't be on the subway for four hours on a Saturday. I like not right now. I just can't. And so balancing that's tough because I do feel, uh, I feel bad about it, you know, in a way, but I guess I'm just doing what I can to like figure out how I can keep it as a part of my life. Like if I retire, I I'm sure I would like to help the kids again, you know, um, or like I do, I'm a photographer by my day job. And so I take the skaters headshots. Like that's a fun thing for me to do. Like I'll I'll always be involved. It's, it'll always be like a part of me, but I also am involved in the WFMU radio station and that's like, okay, great. Now I need another like zero profit, like work you into the ground because we love it. Grassroots organizations. So now I'm giving to both my radio station for my radio show and to WF or, and to to Gotham roller derby, because those are the things I love. It's like, and I love like rescue dogs. It's like all the things I love, like have zero money and need all of my, they need all of me. And I want to give all of me like, because those are the things that are most fun, you know, like, so I don't know, always having a balance, but I like to keep moving all the time. So I think Gotham will always have a place in my life. Uh, however, I can uh, find a way. I mean, it's, it's like a marriage, like people change my relationship to it changes. Like, can I make it work? Can we compromise together? Will we get to a point where we realize we're two completely different people and we can't go on anymore? Like it definitely does have that feeling on the inside because it's been so long, you know? On that note, with Gotham being a nonprofit and the players not getting paid to pay, what motivates you to keep playing? I think I have like a fitness adrenaline addiction 
Like if I don't go, I don't feel well. I, I like need that outlet of like sweat and it doesn't quite do the same thing at like a gym class. It's probably because it's social too, but um, I think that's why I'm, I'm so hooked on it. It, w- it was hard at the beginning of the pandemic, like getting used to not having it. Then I was like, oh, but you have other, there's other things going on. You, you are your own person. You're, you're a person. You're not just Gotham Roller Derby, right? Like you're not just, you're not Susie Hot Rod. You, you can be Jean when you want to, you know, like, but it is still like a huge part of my person. Like if I retired, like would I still be like the Roller Derby person? Probably you know, it wouldn't just like be erased from my history, but um, I'm still a piece of it. You know, other people like to coach and like manage the bench and stuff, but I, I really do like to play the game still. I just have that like itch to play the game, you know, and I can still hold it. I can still hold my own, you know, so I, I, I do love the game. It's, it's not so simple to just be like, I just want to play the game because I understand all the work that's involved to get to the game day. But I do still love to play the game. So roller derby is a sport that really takes a lot of commitment and and heart. And the fact that you guys are nonprofit, you guys have to kind of chip in and pull your weight to keep things running. So besides obviously being a player and obviously there's referees and coaches, what other roles are there, Gotham organization? In our organization, our like work chart of uh, committees and things that need help and need staffing, basically like one time I actually spoke at a, a high school career fair uh, and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm a roller derby player. And they asked me to come here because I, you know, I, I balance a day job and I do this pretty intense hobby. And I'm like, look at this list of our committees. I'm like, tell me a skill that you have that fits one of these committees because every committee has a skill that somebody has in the real world. You know, like we have marketing, bout production, um, the graphic design stuff, the logistics of the website, right? The online ticket sales, the logistics of like the truck rental arrangements, the tryout logistics, like the correspondences with the basic training skaters. Like it is fully like a business. Nonprofits are businesses. If you look at a regular nonprofit, they have employees, they have accountability. And like Gotham right now only actually has one employee and the rest is all really run on volunteer labor. We have one paid employee that is the manager of all of our business of the the paid programming, the classes that kids pay, the parents pay money or like the skaters pay money to come to basic training. So that's it. It's just um, a lot of those volunteer hours for any skill you could imagine. <laughs> like we need copywriters, right? Like uh, people to, to do the social media, like every single aspect of a business. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. Gotham Roller Derby and the Women's Flat Track Derby Association have been around for a while now, and you're one of the OGs, like we had mentioned. So how do you think the league has changed over the years and how has Gotham specifically changed? Well, Gotham uh, certainly over the years has changed. Uh, in the beginning, we were called Gotham Girls Roller Derby. We eventually rebranded to just Gotham Roller Derby. We really try to put a lot of emphasis on inclusivity um, in our connection with the LGBTQ community, with the trans community, gender non-binary, like to be very inclusive and accepting, you know, a place that's a safe space. That's always been uh, important to us. Uh, I think, I think we always had it in our spirit, but we didn't, you know, we weren't talking about it in the beginning. And, and uh, we also like, as we grew, we evolved just like anybody would in the course of 20 years, you know, just like how the world has changed a lot, you know, in the last 20 years, if you think about it that way, like, um, so we're having conversations that we never even thought we were going to have a like be part of it. Like it's like the sport is, uh, it's not just a place to have fun and and sweat. Some of the things that we choose to say are important, like socially, like some of the, you know, our social media posts, we'll, we'll say things that are much more past just a sport, right? Like, like we, um, you know, like, uh, I don't want to say it's like political things, but like things about inclusivity, things about our community, like things that are important to us. And it's stuff that we just, you know, as a person who's been around a long time, like it's just stuff that we didn't really even like think about before, but that's also like how our whole world is in a way, you know, like if you think about the way things operate 
now versus the way they were 15, 20 years ago. Like we have conversations about diversity, inclusivity, like important things that um, maybe we just kind of like took for granted and didn't realize that we were not doing well at at all, you know, until like people started to open their eyes and be like, this is important stuff. We have to talk about it. Let's talk about it out loud. So that's certainly something that's um, happened as the league has grown for sure. And how does the league stay afloat? The league stays afloat. We have to pay our dues. Certainly all the skaters have to pay a monthly due. We have some savings from when things were more operationally sound before COVID, but it's the ticket sales from the bouts. It's the merch sales. And then we basically just have to put it right back in because we have to rent the space that we practice in. We have to rent the venue that we have the game in. And, um, you know, we're in this really big fundraiser, like, because in order to get a new practice space, like they did the math and figured out that we needed like $200,000 to get in, in upwards of like $600,000. And we were just like, oh my gosh, like how did we do this before? But because it was like a different time, things cost less. Like, so we have a good product, we have a good business, but um, it's, it's always like in and out, in and out, you know? Uh, and, you know, we have some sponsors and stuff, but it is a little grassroots, you know, where we don't have like Pepsi coming in and giving us millions of dollars. Like we have like some local bars that'll give uh, money to put their logo on our Jersey or, you know, like a, a local beer sponsor. Like we're very close with the Coney Island Brewing Company. Like they're very generous to us and they are, they're great business partners, but I assume that it's not the same the way Budweiser is with the Mets. You know, we're always looking to grow. We're certainly always looking for new sponsors. So if you're listening, uh, we're a great place to reach a lot of cool people. And um, we also need to do more grant applications and grant writing because we are a community group that reaches a lot of different people. So uh, we do qualify for grants, but it's a lot of work also to to write and apply for all of that. So, you know, that's kind of how we keep afloat. So so go to GG or oh, sorry, GothamRollerDerby.com and you know, consider buying a t-shirt or making a donation or really direct to consumer, you know? <laughs> yeah, like supporting in many different ways right like go to a game buy tickets even if it's like if money even is the thing just tell a friend i heard a podcast about roller derby did you even know that was a thing did you know there's one in almost every city did you know that like just the word of mouth uh is also really helpful too yeah because i mean we're in new jersey and i only knew of maybe like a couple but there's way more than i thought there would have been just even in a state alone yeah, it's it, there. There is a local roller derby, you know. Hopefully, within a a certain radius, there we are everywhere, and we would love to have you. Anybody in the whole world, there's probably a little support. Your local roller derby is kind of a saying, you know. Yeah, and just to talk about COVID a little bit, so that really rocked the sports world in in many different ways. You know, how did Gotham survive? You know, how did you all kind of band together during COVID? COVID was definitely a challenge. Uh, we tried to do some digital things, you know, like our home team would have some meetups where we would like work out on Zoom together. We hosted some like um, bout viewing events where like skaters would narrate old games, like just to like get people online and watching and interacting with us. But we did also like suffer a, a, a dark moment, you know, like where people really just needed to be off of it or checked out. We lost a lot of skaters, you know, uh, the, the actual COVID time was very difficult. Like sometimes we would arrange like an outdoor skate or something, but it was just so unprecedentedly scary and weird. And um, we did lose a lot of skaters, but we also like got more because for some reason, uh, a lot of people found a love of roller skating during the pandemic because they could go outside and be like, I think I'm just going to learn how to roller skate. And like, I don't know if it was like TikTok or something, but like it made a lot of people just like want to roller skate. And like our friends own a roller skate store called Five Stride Skate Shop. And like they couldn't even keep skates on the shelf. Right. So we did get a lot of new skaters from the pandemic. So that was kind of a silver lining. And we have a lot of new people and hopefully they'll help us grow through it. But it was definitely a dark, challenging time, you know, for a full contact sports league where we're basically like bidding all over each other, you know, like we're very sweaty, we're gross. We're... When everybody came back to skating immediately, like everyone was sick. Like when you send your toddler to school and every, the whole family just gets sick because we're just like, we need our baseline of like filth, like our, our bio, bio known bio. We need to get all our bacterias of one another back. And we're, we're, you know, we're slowly rebuilding, you know, we miss our practice space. It's hard kind of being temporary. We would skate outside. There could be rain, you know, like it's, it's hard to keep thriving, but you know, everything 
was affected by that and everything is always growing and changing and there's always somebody willing to step up and someone willing to try it. So we're still here and uh, hopefully we always will be here. How can we help? You know, how can our audience help? Yeah. So if you feel that excitement for roller derby after I've showed it to you, come see a game for sure. We have more games. Check our schedule. Just go to GothamRollerDerby.com. We have a game in August, September, and October left. If you're curious about learning how to roller skate, we have classes on Saturdays. If you have a child, we have junior classes. If you think this is cool and just want to make a donation, we have a donation button right on our website because we do need to raise money to get ourselves back in this. If you want just buy a t-shirt, you know, that would be great. You can buy a t-shirt uh, or if you want to get involved in our community and you're not really sure how, like drop us a line and join our volunteers list. Even some, some things as simple as like a person there on game day that helps unload the truck. These are all like ways you can get involved. We are very grassroots still. And there are ways that like, if you hear this and you are like, oh, sometimes I just want to do a volunteer thing once in a while, like literally you can help us unload the truck because like when we have a double header, like I unload the truck and then in 20 minutes later, I put on makeup and I play roller derby because that's just how we have to do it. So we could definitely use some extra hands uh, doing simple things like that. So, you know, financially or with your with your body, you know, or with your with your hand computer, with your social media, I'll be like, oh wow, did you know roller derby exists? I just heard on this awesome podcast, I heard about roller derby. Check this out. Like spread the word and, you know, put money into things that you believe in. If you think that like women in sports is important, if you think that like things that aren't corporately sponsored where you can have the freedom of speech, do what you want, wear what you want, be who you are, like. This is probably something that you would really like to support. At its core, you know, I love the game and I love the community. And I hope that I was able to instill in others like that great feeling that I get. And I, I have a personality that I like, can reflect back the energy, you know. So if you're one of those people, I hope you can like feel the energy that I have for this. Like, wow, you know, like, and I hope it, it makes you get the goosebumps that you want to be like, wow, that's so cool. Like that's happening. That's happening near me in my city. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, hopefully it gets people interested. Hopefully it gets people skating or out to games or gets people volunteering. Yeah, the more roller skating, the better. Go, just go out in the in the parking lot, or you know, that's the one. <laughs> that's thing how I, I started. <laughs> I cannot roller skate to save my life. I am always impressed with adults that have never done it that try. It is like really a steep learning curve. Kick children, they're like you know rubber. They just like go, and, and you're like, whoa. <laughs> Even as a kid, I was I my parents bought me skates. I was like, I can't use these. But roller blades were a little easier. Roller skates, I just I really suck at ice skating. I think I'm only good on the quad skate. But it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for having me on your show. Thanks for joining us. It was great. Thank you, Susie. This was this was awesome. Thank you. Well, that's it for this episode of Bound by the Cloak. We'd like to thank Susie Hot Rod for joining us on today's show. When Susie isn't lacing up her skates, you can check out her radio show, Rock and Roller Derby with Susie Hot Rod, Sundays 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time on WFMU. You can also check her out on Wednesdays, 10 a.m. to noon on WFMU's Rock and Soul Radio. We want to give a shout out to Gotham Roller Derby, as well as all of the other WFTDA Roller Derby Leagues out there. For more information, check out Gotham Roller Derby's website, www.gothamrollerderby.com. We'll also have the link in our show notes. They're also super active on social media, so check out their Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to know what's going on, when their next games are, or just to know how you can support them. And you can do this by volunteering your time, buying some tickets and checking out a game, getting some merchandise, and also donating to support their cause. Gotham Roller Derby's season is almost over, but there are some games left for you to check out. There's a game this weekend, August 19th. Check out Manhattan Mayhem vs. Bronx Gridlock. They'll be playing at the Lafrac Center at Lakeside Prospect Park in Brooklyn. There are also other games to check out. They have games on September 9th and October 14th. Make sure you check out a game before the season ends. We'll have a lot of information about Roller Derby, WFTDA, Gotham Roller Derby, and more on our website, so be sure to check out our show notes. 
as always, you can like, subscribe, follow us on social media. We are on what used to be Twitter and is now X. <laughs> we are on Instagram. We are on threads. So be sure to like, follow, subscribe. And obviously, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's Spotify, Apple. I've said it before. We are everywhere. Thanks for listening to this episode of Bound by the Cloak. We'll see you again in two weeks with a brand spanking new episode. Until then. Thanks for listening.